Um, if you don't know me, my name is Kevin Taylor. Um, my family and I, we've, we're fairly new to the congregation, and um, uh, we moved here back in August, right in the middle of the COVID lockdowns, and, and uh, we uh, had a few friends that were here, and, and we jumped in, and um, we were so thankful to, to have a wonderful congregation to, to come to in the middle of all that, in the middle of a move, in the middle of uh, COVID, um, finding a congregation that was meeting and uh, finding a, a place for our kiddos to go and go to class and youth group. And um, we, just, we just really appreciate you, appreciate you welcoming us. And um, um, it's been, uh, this is just a really, really neat congregation. We really appreciate you. Um, so in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, and, and so tonight, um, we're con- going to continue our series, on our Wednesday night series, uh, following the example of Jesus. And tonight I'm going to cover the topic of following the example of Jesus and death. Uh, Matthew 27, verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, yama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, we all have memories of growing up. So think in your mind, try to go back as far as you can in your memory to your very first memory of, of being alive. You ever try to do that? Um, think, think back, very first memory, and then think back as a child and try to remember um, the first time that you experienced um, any, uh, any kind of death in your family or, or friends. Um, some of us have more traumatic experiences than others. Um, my, my, I, I go back in my memory, and my very first memory, I had to be very, very young, um, toddler, I guess, but I, I remember going to a funeral. I barely remember it, but it was uh, my dad's first cousin um, who had, she had passed away of a cancer, I believe, and I just barely remember that, but it, but it, it sticks in my memory because it, because it was so different. Um, to, to see that. Um, uh, I did then, you know, had several other experiences that, you know, throughout my childhood of, of, of seeing that kind of thing. But then um, the, the next one that really um, I, uh, sticks in my memory is when I was about 14 or 15. Uh, my uncle um, passed away, my dad's older brother. And um, that one uh, meant a lot to me because I was, I was fairly close to him and I, I really looked up to him and he's a re- really neat uh, individual. Um, but, but also just watching um, his parents, my grandparents, um, suffer through that and mourn and watching my dad. And that, that was, you know, that was a, a, big, a big deal to me. And, and um, I remember seeing my dad's best friend soon after that pass away in a car accident. He was, his son was a really good friend of mine and you know, just watching people react to that and, my, and, and watching myself react to that it was, was, a, was a memory that I had. And so I, I, I say all these things uh, to, to just try to kind of get it in your mind. When, when was the first time you just you, you realized, had a, had a realization of, of death and death being a part of, of life? Um, <clears throat> as you... As you grow up and you, you begin to understand life, you, you begin to understand that death is a reality. And um, um, you, start to, you start to think a little bit more about things. And um, so I want you to kind of think about how does, how does knowing that about death, um, how does that cause you to live in your life? How does that cause individuals to live in their life? I was reading in Acts uh, several days ago in um, Acts 23 when Paul, he stirs up the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Do you remember what he did to stir them up? What was the differences? What's, what's one of the differences between a Pharisee and a Sadducee in their beliefs? That's right. Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, right? And I got to thinking about that. Um, how, do you, how does one person go through life not, um, not believing in, a, in the resurrection? Uh, living day to day, 
without that belief in their life? How do they view life? How do they go through, you know, each day? Um, you know, back to my uh, uncle passing away. Um, that was that was a big experience for me. But he, I remember after that was somewhat of a learning experience for me as well because my my grandfather. Um, so. I turned 15 and my parents allowed me to get a hardship driver's license and I spent the summer driving my grandfather around on the farm and around town. He was, he was getting blind and I don't remember what, he was in his probably late 80s, but he was, he was really mourning that loss of his son. But the thing about my grandfather, he, he believed in God, but um, he always said he didn't understand it. He, didn't, uh, he wasn't smart enough to understand the Bible and he just kind of always pushed it away, and he, he didn't have a true belief um, in, in, in the resurrection, um, didn't understand Scripture, didn't understand who Jesus was. My grandmother did. She was, she was a Christian, but he didn't. And I watched him um, as he suffered through that loss, and, and I look back on it, and I, and, and I realize now why he acted the way he did. He was a normally very fun guy, real funny, just a neat guy. But when he was experiencing that, he was not. He was, he was angry. Um, he was in a bad mood. And, 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 you know, and, and I, I look back and I understand why. The good news is, uh, later, a few years later, when he was, I think he was 91, he was baptized. He became a Christian. Um, but I, but I, I think about what it was like not to understand the resurrection or not to understand life after death. <clears throat> um, so, you see, I guess, you know, barring our Lord's return um, beforehand, we, we, all, we all die. Um, and we'll likely experience uh, many um, other deaths along the way. Um, I find it interesting. I, I grew up around uh, farming, and um, um, my, both sides of my uh, grandparents were different kinds of farmers, and and I grew up around that some, and um, it seems like farmers and folks that are in that life probably have a little bit more of a grip on the reality of death, it is my experience. I remember as a kid going, we traveled to see my mom's uh, parents, farmers up in Milshu area, and, um, and we'd spend the first couple hours just visiting with them, and, and I remember as a kid kind of uh, noticing that they talked a lot about just, you know, this animal died, and these people down the road, she died, and they died, and they, you know, and they were at an age where they knew a lot of people that were dying, but they also, they, I just remember thinking, well, they, they just kind of speak of it as just, like, it's just a part of life, and it is. It's a part of life, right? And uh, <clears throat> so I, I was thinking about it as we were, as, as I was preparing for this lesson. Um, you know, our, our, our lives are busy. Uh, our, we have an entertainment-centric life. A lot of times, I think that distracts us from reality sometimes of death. Um, it, uh, it distracts us, but it doesn't change the reality that there, that there is death. And, and I think Christians, in my opinion sometimes, and I, I'll probably speak more for myself, um, but Christians um, struggle with recon reconciling our Bible, our biblical knowledge of death with um, our own fear of death. Uh, Jim McGuigan in his book, The Dragon Slayer, um, he says something like this. It's not a direct quote, but he says, you know, if, if Jesus has defeated the world and the evil powers and death, why do they still exist? Why do we still have to face the troubles of this world like death? The Lord defeated the world and death. The existence of the world and death does not mean he hasn't conquered them. The Lord uses it, though, to gain his purposes while he brings the whole cosmos to a grand and glorious finale. I think that, I thought that was a neat <clears throat> way to say it. But, it, but it. but the reality is we do still have to face that, this physical world and this physical death. And um, so we as believers um, have to think about that. Um, it's an opportunity for we as believers to be a, a testimony for the world and facing death, death and, and honestly, openly facing death. 
Um, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read that. Uh, 15 verse 41. I mean, sorry, 15 verse 51. <clears throat> Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with Im immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will become true. Death has been swallowed by, up by victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God... He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Jesus gave his disciples, and he gives us an example of how to face death. How did the apostles, how did his disciples, his apostles, um, once they experienced his realness and, his, and, and once they became truly faithful in him, how did they face death? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, um, is a reminder of Paul's attitude towards earthly death. I eagerly, eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, <clears throat> whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the world, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what, I sh what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. These are Paul's words. This is Paul's attitude once he's tasted the realness of Christ, right? <clears throat> in Christ, the Bible gives us knowledge of of a glorious life after this earthly life in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, by, uh, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13 through 18 tells us, do not, do not grieve for those who fall asleep in Christ. The Lord will come and the dead will rise. <clears throat> There's so many more verses that we can, we can go to in the Bible that um, give us a, uh, an idea of the hope that we have in this life. Uh, you know, once, once we understand resurrection, once we st understand Christ after this physical death. A lot can be studied <clears throat> about this subject. Um, I think about the rich man and Lazarus, and, and, and I may have a, a little bit different way of thinking about that, but in chapter 16, we read about Lazarus and, and the rich man, and we won't study that tonight, but, but I believe it gives us a picture of of uh, paradise and Hades. Um, but there's just a lot of things we can study. Um, we, um, 
<clears throat> when we think about Jesus and how he faced death, there's a lot of things we can look at there too. Um, so I want you to think about Jesus in what, in what he did, right? So he, he left something. He left um, he was, he was by his father's side, and he left that. He came to this earth. Um, he, joined, he joined this family that we have on this earth of suffering, right? He, he, he entered the cloud of suffering, the cloud of pain, um, temptation, and death. So let's think about a little bit of, about him and, and how he faced that death in, in um, we won't we won't look at all the examples tonight and but I wanted to look at a few um, one of the things that first came to my mind was just uh, not his own death but the death of Lazarus his friend um, what did he do in, in uh, John chapter 11 verse 35 he he went he was there Lazarus had died he was we, he, he knew what he was going to do with Lazarus, but what, what did he do? He cried. He wept, right? Why did he cry? You ever thought about that? I'm sure you have. He was, he, he, I think he felt the same thing we feel as far as the, the sadness and separation of the loss. I think about what he was, he was looking, you know, he was res maybe responding to what he was looking at around him, the, the, um, his sisters, uh, Lazarus, his sisters and his um, friends and their sadness. Maybe he was just sad at the, the state of the human race, right? Um, maybe he was sad at the fact that so many didn't understand. Um, but he wept, he cried. In Luke 22, we learn that Jesus in the garden um, wanted the cup of death to pass. He, he asked God to take it from him. All right? But he deferred to God's will. So we know that he was deeply troubled. We read that he was deeply troubled. He struggled mightily with, in, you know, with the idea of... of what he was facing, the fear um, was was intense. Um, so we know we know he was. Um, but then we see that he faced being arrested. He faced being, um, uh, you know, the you know the, the you know the the idea of being arrested and being taken to the authorities. And being threatened, and being spit on, and being lied about, um, beaten. He did all that, <clears throat> and we're going to see that he did that with with words and actions aimed at others, at caring for others, the whole time. He he, he had us in mind as he was doing that, as he was facing death. He knew others were watching him. Rather than being wrapped in self-pity for suffering the most unjust death, um, our Lord was showing his care for his creation. His purpose for life on earth was to face death. Uh, someone said that last week. I don't remember if it was in a lesson or maybe on last Wednesday night. But his, his purpose on life was to face death. Christ is showing us how to give our lives to the Father. Another quote from McGuigan, Jim McGuigan. Um, um, I recently read one of his books, and that's why a lot of, his, a lot of the things I read came to my mind as I studied this. But in the cross, we see God getting what he deserved. He says, what we should always have given him, finally and completely a human gave to God. As an obedient child, what the Holy Father was worthy of is what Jesus did <clears throat> as he died. 
In John, we read that Jesus prays for his disciples and he prays for his believers prior to being arrested. Right? He had others in mind as he faced death. As you go to Luke chapter 23, you see that Jesus, he goes to God as he's being, you know, as he's facing this death and, he, death and he says, forgive the very people that are crucifying him. Right? Thinking about others. And later in Luke 23, um, on the cross, a criminal next to him on the cross, what does he do for the criminal? As he's dying, he forgives him, right? He says, um, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Right. <clears throat> uh, in John, we read about Jesus on the cross as he takes care of his mother. He asked John to treat her as his own mother. Jesus shows um, in death how we are to care for our loved ones. He shows in life how to care for our loved ones, but he shows it in death as well. Um, I think there's a whole lesson there. But uh, what I find really fascinating is, is his encouraging words and, his, and, and the, things that, the things that occurred on the cross as he died and as he spoke to those that understand and believe in him. <clears throat> so just think back. If you're standing there watching Jesus die on the cross, um, you, you saw some pretty amazing things, right? Just put, your, put yourself in that moment. You saw some pretty amazing things. You saw darkness. For how long? For three hours, right? Darkness. The earth shook, an earthquake. But you also heard Jesus speak at times on the cross. <clears throat> If you were a Jew and you heard him speak, you heard some familiar statements. You heard some things that you were familiar with. <clears throat> um, so th those of us who grew up in the church, or those of us who have been around the church for some time, um, didn't even take that long, but you, you start to associate, uh, you, you become... You, you start to recognize songs, right? So Sonny gets up here and sings, says amazing, great, amazing Grace. We know how to finish that, right? The battle belongs to the Lord. We know a lot of us can finish that. Um, Heavenly Sunlight, um, you know, we can finish that song. Um, we're familiar with these things because we're around them all the time. And they automatically come to our, our mind. The tune of the song comes to mind. Um, so from what I understand and what I read, and I, and I may be wrong, but what I, what I understand is the Jews, um, many of them that were standing there, were very used to and familiar with the Psalms. They, they grew up learning the Psalms. They chanted the songs on a regular basis. So when they heard a verse from a Psalm, a Psalm of David, for example, they probably could finish it. They memorized, they chanted those songs. Um, so I think of those Jews that are standing there, those that believe and those that don't believe uh, in, in who Jesus is, they recognize those things. And, and Jesus is there enduring physical misery, nails in his feet, in his hands, suffering, and he, he speaks. Um... He speaks a deeper meaning than many, I think, understood. But those who were familiar with the word, I think, maybe they did. Or maybe they, were, maybe they questioned. In, in John chapter 19, 28, he says, I thirst. Right, very simple. In death, he was thirsty. But some tie that back to an Old Testament scripture of Psalms 42, 2. Or even Psalm 69, 21, when it says um, they gave him a vinegar for his thir thirst. In Luke <clears throat> chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus quotes Psalms 
31.5, in his last statement, he says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. I believe there's some standing there that recognize that. I know many of them were familiar with those psalms. <clears throat> and they weren't just from some suffering man. I think they had meaning. But my favorite of, of all these, I think, is, is, the, is what I started with tonight in the Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. We read that Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Turn to Psalms chapter 22. Psalms chapter 22. Bear with me, but I'm going to read. I might read the whole thing. <clears throat> Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? This is a psalm of David. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel, and your fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and, you, and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, but the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help me. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Here's a psalm, a song. The Jews are, they heard him say that. I, I think they recognize that. Um, but it doesn't end here. Has God truly forsaken Jesus? Let's read on. <clears throat> but you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve them. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to, people, to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him. I don't know about you, but for a long time when I read, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I just thought about him being forsaken. But there's the Psalms 22, there's the rest of the story. He's not been despised or disdained. He has done it. 
Imagine being there and hearing this. As a Jewish leader, who you, under, you know, that, you know that, that scripture. You know the Psalms. You know Psalms 22, which wasn't Psalms 22 then, but they, know that they knew the Psalms, right? Imagine being there. Imagine watching the soldiers casting lots for his clothing. That's right out of Psalms 22. Think about it as you realize that that is right out of Psalms, right out of the, right out of the, own, the words that you've sang and, and, and read and quoted your whole life. As he dies, as Jesus dies, and as he draws his last breath, <clears throat> he's, he's preaching. He's preaching to those around him. He's preaching to all of us. He's giving us deeper meaning of the cross. There's so much meaning in the cross. Um, in Galatians 6, Paul says, No boasting for me, none except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, the reality is that we face physical death on this earth, and it's not easy. Um, it's not easy for me to consider that. It's not e I don't think it's easy for any of us to consider that and to face that. Um, and we shouldn't think that it's going to be easy. Um, but we do have <clears throat> this example of Jesus, um, our Lord, and, and we, ex we, we have an example that he did. He was afraid. Um, he prayed. He prayed a lot. <clears throat> um, he was scared. But he also showed us, at the end of the day, he showed us the example of love for others as he died. For others meaning us. Um, uh, love for us all. And we have a life uh, with him once we pass, once we cross the Jordan. And one of my, one of my favorite songs that Mac talked about last week, um, I think or maybe a Sunday night, reading the words of a song sometimes is helpful. Sometimes you hear it differently. And one of my favorite is, I'm a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm going there to see my Father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I know dark clouds will gather around me. I know my way is rough and steep. The golden fields lie just before me where God's redeemed shall ever sleep. I'm going home to see my mother and all my loved ones who've gone on. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I am a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe, yet there's no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. <laughs> um, I appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to, and being patient with me tonight. And, and um, If you don't mind, uh, would you bow with me and pray?